Thank you very much. Good morning to everybody. Bon dia, bonjour. In this session, several projects, several examples of international cooperation will be uh, described and uh, discussed. Good morning to all. Uh, I will uh, uh, present you the, the achievements uh, at WEVEC in these last years, and I will focus my presentation on the international uh, service. Um, WEVEC as a non-profit association was created in 2003, and we have currently 12 associates, uh, energy companies, uh, the three Portuguese utilities, EDA, uh, uh, EDP in the mainland, EDA in Azores, and in Madeira, Ocean Plug, the manager of the Portuguese pilot zone. Uh, we also have um, research, sorry, um, research in academic uh, um, uh, institutions, uh, suppliers of uh, components in manufacturers, and uh, uh, companies ranging service in the maritime uh, domain. Uh, and uh, uh, we are funded, uh, funded mainly by uh, R&D European uh, projects. Uh, also, 25% uh, of our income come from uh, new products and services funded by other sources like Kiko Ino Energy. And 25% of our uh, income come from a consulting service for uh, international uh, organizations and companies. Um, our goal is to implement a marine energy industry and to achieve this goal, uh, we uh, do technical and strategic support to companies and governmental bodies. Uh, we developed uh, products uh, ready for the industry. Uh, we uh, interact and collaborate, collaborate with uh, all stakeholders and we um, promote the identification and mitig mitigation of technical and non-technical barriers. And this is uh, aligned with our version of uh, being um, uh, internationally recognized uh, center of excellence in marine renewable energies. Um, we are able to deliver service on a var variety of uh, uh, areas ranging from uh, technologies and monitoring, monitoring to uh, marine environment and public policies, uh, numerical modeling and design of new concepts, uh, economy and industry. And uh, uh, with uh, our knowledge all over these years, we have been compiling all this information related with projects, technologies, investments, components in a database that is uh, used for doing our market studies for the industry. And uh, so these are our core areas, and across these uh, areas we deliver uh, training. Uh, for internships, masters and PhD studies. We will have uh, Yannick, Boris and, um, and Mathieu uh, uh, providing, uh, talking about his experience as PhD studies at uh, WAVEC. Uh, we do several dissemination actions using different channels of communication and uh, we promote uh, public outreach with local uh, commu communities and with the public in general. Um, we have been working with, uh, around with uh, different, uh, in different projects uh, throughout the, the world, developing service for many developers uh, to uh, energy companies like uh, EDP, Shell, Iberdrola, Repsol, and also to international organizations like the Ocean Energy Systems Technology Initiative within the, the International Energy Agency. And on the European level, uh, this year we were working with the Joint Research Center of the European Commission. We are also uh, we are uh, part of the uh, board members of the European Ocean Energy Association. 
Uh, we have a track record on, in participation on R&D projects. You can see here the, the evolution in this last year. So we started in 2004 with one, two projects. And in these last years, we have been involved in uh, uh, 11, 12, 13, 14 uh, projects. Uh, these uh, projects cover many topics from ocean energy to offshore uh, wind energy. Uh, ocean technology and the environment. Uh, it represents a collaboration with more than 100 uh, uh, international uh, uh, partners. And we see how you can see how also the increase uh, uh, of budget all over the last years, and uh, this shows our uh, our significant uh, uh, role uh, increasing in these uh, R&D projects. Uh, uh, now, the, now we are leading two projects, uh, Wet Feet and uh, Oceanet, and Jose uh, Candid will speak uh, about these two projects. Um, we also have a, a project at Wavec uh, related with reviewing the Portuguese uh, legislation. Uh, these internal projects are usually in areas that we consider relevant uh, to mitigate uh, barriers in progress in marine energies in Portugal. And we are, uh, the, the aim or the goal of this project is to attract companies, uh, developers to Portugal and attracting this uh, investment as well. Uh, and we are working with, heights, uh, uh, with seven highly qualified lawyers trying to identify gaps in legislation on these three topics, licensing, environment, and planning. The next step will be a workshop where we will invite you to, to join it. Uh, in terms of strategic, strategic studies, we have been working with uh, Costa Rica uh, uh, accessing the energy potential for and uh, recommending a strategy uh, for development of marine energies in this country. We also worked with Chile, with the Ministry of Energy, with funding from the Inter-American Bank of Development to recommend also uh, a, a strategy for marine energies in the country. Um, there are several pro uh, projects happening in Portugal, and we have been involved in most of them, all of them, in, in fact, with more strong involvement in, uh, 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 in some projects than, than uh, in others. You can see here some pictures of our team uh, working at the, the sea. I will very briefly just mention a few projects, uh, starting with Pico Plant, that is owned by Wavec, is a fully grid connected plant that was built in the 90s with funding from the European Commission and is now uh, operated by, by Wavec. And uh, we, you can see the slight increase in the energy production. Uh, this uh, represents the effort of a dedicated team at, uh, at Pico Plant. Uh, this, uh, uh, this pilot project was also included in these last three years in the network of uh, 40 testing infrastructure. So Pico was of one of them providing training and research to, uh, to young students. Uh, wave Roller in Peniche is an example of a project where we had a strong involvement. Erki will present this project. Our key activities were uh, related with the evaluation of the power performance uh, then, that uh, was then verified by DNV. Uh, we, were also, we have done also mar uh, marine environmental monitoring and other water inspections with, uh, with ROV, and we have done many actions related with public outreach. Um, the, uh, the, the project from uh, the Swedish company Core Power that will be presented by uh, Patrick, um, it's also another example with a strong uh, involvement of WEVEC. We have done feasibility studies and benchmarking analysis. Uh, we assisted in the tank testing at Portugal and in, in at France at Ecole Centrale de Nantes. And we have done the, the numerical modeling of the system's uh, dynamics. And uh, now we are uh, working in the mooring survivability analysis. Um, 
the, the project from a Spanish company Wedge is also a project where we have uh, been uh, involved. Uh, we have done due diligence uh, studies, market studies, the, uh, the modeling of the, the cost uh, of energy of this project and uh, also numerical modeling studies. This company uh, recently received uh, funding from a, a funding uh, agency in EDU, and we will be working in these uh, next years with this company as well. Uh, these projects were in wave energy, uh, this one offshore, uh, with the floating uh, uh, offshore wind uh, turbine from, uh, that we already heard this morning. Uh, we have uh, had also a strong involvement in this uh, project at different levels, starting from, uh, um, from uh, numerical uh, modeling uh, uh, analysis, environmental impact assessments, uh, we have then also prepared the industrialization plan for the next uh, phase and uh, um, many actions related with public uh, outreach. And we will be involved also in the next uh, uh, the project at uh, um, uh, Vienna do, Cast do Castelo. Uh, we bring uh, new solutions to, to the, we help to bring new solutions to the, the market and these are uh, some of the, the examples of uh, the, working, uh, the work that we are doing. Uh, Prodron, uh, wind tur tur turbine blade inspection, it's in fact the first spin-off of Wevec and uh, Andre will, uh, will speak about this, uh, this project, the director of this, this company. Uh, Kraken, it's another project, it's about empowering uh, uh, small ROVs, uh, building an articulated arm for uh, specialized in, uh, underwater inspections, and the multi-parametric buoy for um, mon monitoring uh, uh, marine energy devices uh, and uh, also environmental aspects. So these uh, products were developed by Wevec and also by, by other partners, other Portuguese partners as well. Um, and it was funded by uh, Kik Inno Energy, partially. And finally, uh, our team. So all this work would have not been possible without the, the strong commitment and the dedication uh, of our team. And now, now I will give the word to my colleague. Thank you. Okay, yours. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Anna's uh, presentation focused on a bit on what we are and what we do in an overall manner. I will focus more on our participation in European projects and our approach uh, in particular to leadership. Um, collaboration is embedded in our uh, DNA. You can, you can see that clearly from, from Anna's presentation. Um, in this context, the European Union framework programs for research and development and research innovation offer the right environment to develop this sort of collaborative effort. Uh, in fact, we've been participating since our foundation about 12 years ago in more than 20 European projects. This has allowed us to develop a wide network of over 100 international partners, as uh, uh, Anna also mentioned, and this is a, a key aspect of what I'm talking, will be talking after. Um, so, what has been our approach to European projects? Very often, more often than not, in a, in a research project, you find yourself in a crossroad in which you don't know which is the, the right step to follow. Uh, it is easier in the in tempting in this situation just to sit back and wait for the, the leadership of the project, the coordinators to tell you basically what to do and when to do it. This has not been our approach to, to European projects in which we have been participating. We always know what we want to develop for ourselves, the interests we have within the projects and the interests that the project has. At the same time, we don't, once we know what to do, we don't sit in our hands waiting for the leadership to tell us when to do it. We basically simply do it. Leadership. Uh, in this more than 20 projects that I mentioned, we've been involved in leadership at uh, task, work package uh, level, and uh, we've been also uh, part of steering committees in ma many of these projects. We try to work as much as possible in collaboration with the coordination teams. And this has allowed us to have a very good insight of how 
European projects actually work uh, from the coordination point of view and how they should run and develop uh, to accomplish their objectives. So how did you go from partners in projects to uh, leaders in, in European projects? Uh, there are two things that you need to know. The first one is that you don't have a project if you don't have good partners, I think it's obvious. And the second one is that you cannot lead a project if the partners you have in the project do not trust you to do it uh, that successfully. So branding yourself, uh, uh, delivering high quality, excellence work in due time, it's a very important aspect when you're participating in a project if you want to later on develop and go to a step uh, uh, further to, to lead a project. Uh, what makes a good project? That's an, also a good question. We have discussed this internally a few times. Uh, obviously, this is a topic that by itself would provide material for a full presentation. Instead, I just uh, uh, decided to focus uh, a few aspects which I think are among the most important to this respect. The first one is that you obviously need to have a solid idea of what you want to develop, what you want to propose. And uh, it has to, you have to have the right timing to propose this idea and to move uh, uh, forward with this idea. The second one is that you need to uh, place special care in framing the, the, the work you want to propose within the call that you have in hand. We've seen very good projects simply being refused for funding uh, just because they were not uh, uh, correctly framed within the calls that w they were applying to. Uh, of course, you, have to, you, ne you, need, you need to know clearly that your project has purpose and relevance and you need to state this and have this presented at every step. You need to define clear, simple and attainable objectives uh, which will uh, give you the confidence that you can fulfill the project and you also give the confidence to the funding entity that you will take the project to the end. And obviously you need to build a strong partnership that will give you the necessary basis of confidence uh, that you will fulfill uh, the project and take it to the end. Uh, so I will focus, as Anna said, in two of the projects that we are currently leading. The first one is Wetfeet. Uh, when the first work programs of Horizon 2020 were published, we were invited for a few proposals. Um, at the time, we felt that the work was interesting, but we didn't feel that it was uh, tackling what has to be done to um, um, address the problem of the wave energy sector not uh, being developed as we wish it would be. Uh, so we decided to come up with our own project. The full name is Wave Energy Transition to Future by Evolution of M Engineering and Technology. This was a response to the Horizon 2020 competitive low carbon energy call, in particular the LC1 topic, uh, which means that we're basically proposing to bring technologies from readiness level two to readiness level three to four. Uh, the project started in last May it will run until uh, April 2018. The overall budget is of around 3.5 million euros. Uh, our budget in particular is a bit less than uh, 700,000 euros. Uh, the project starts from pinpointing the factors that in our view have been slowing down uh, wave energy's progress. Uh, and it goes on to identify and develop what we called a set of breakthrough features, which are no more than components, systems, and process, which we believe that will imp uh, help improve the, the, the sector of wave energy as a whole. Uh, the focus is on these breakthrough features, but they are developed in the context of two, context of two specific technologies, in particular the, the oscillator water column and the uh, symphony, which is a follow-up of uh, Teamworks uh, AWS. Uh, very briefly, I will run through the, the, um, the breakthroughs that we are proposing. The first one is a survivability breakthrough, uh, which is basically consisting in studying uh, the options for uh, the submergence of the devices under storm conditions. The other one is operation maintenance breakthrough uh, via the continuous submergence of the device and the adaptation of the components and the operation maintenance strategies that are required. Uh, PTO breakthrough, in which basically we will st we'll study um, 
and develop uh, inno innovative uh, power takeoff alternatives, uh, in particular uh, electromechanic equipment and also um, polymeric elastometers, uh, which are a follow-up of uh, PolyWeg project. Um, then performance optimization, uh, which will consist on uh, practical implementation and functionality of a negative spring uh, uh, for uh, an oscillating water column. And finally, the array breakthrough in which we'll study uh, the possibility of sharing uh, mooring and connection and electrical connections um, between nearby devices uh, in terms of optimization of the performance, but also, and most importantly, uh, by minimizing the costs and the environmental impact. Uh, this is our consortium for this project. Uh, we have uh, a good spread all across Europe. We have uh, partners from Portugal, Netherlands, UK, France, you know, see that was already uh, talking here, uh, and also Italy and Austria. Uh, we try to cover um, a very, um, in the profiles of our, of our partners, we try to cover a very wide expertise so that we could have the confidence that we would uh, fulfill the work that we had to carry out to, to, to take the project to the end. Um, yeah, uh, so this was about wet feet. I mentioned before that uh, collaboration is uh, a very important part of our uh, uh, DNA, but so is training and education. Uh, it's no coincidence that we started as a startup of a university, in particular the Technical University of Lisbon. Uh, we've been involved in the coordination of uh, two initial training networks on wave energy, wave, the wave train and wave train two. And we are now coordinating uh, a third one, a, a, a multinational initial training network, which is dedicated not only to wave energy, but also to floating offshore wind. Um, this is funded under the, the European Union seven framework program, in particular the people program, uh, which is in, uh, integrated in the Marie Curie actions that you may know. We have uh, 10 network partners, uh, which are providing training to 13 early stage researchers. We have 18 associated partners from the industry. Uh, the project started in September 2013 and will run until August 2017. The overall budget is of around 3.4 million euros. Uh, WaveX budget for this project is around 730,000 euros. Uh, again, this is our consortium uh, spread all across Europe. Uh, on the left, you see the network partners that I mentioned, and on the right, the 18 associated partners which will be providing uh, training and secondment opportunities to our fellows. Um, so why uh, having wave energy and floating offshore wind energy in, in, in the same package? Uh, well basically, the main reason is because they were, they're both part of an emerging offshore renewable energy industry uh, um, and they share, as a consequence, several changes, uh, challenges, several features, um, and uh, there are synergies that we can explore. Um, the main objective of the project, the project, obviously, is to provide high-quality training to a new generation of scientists and, and engineers. Uh, so to support the emerging uh, uh, sector of offshore renewable energy. We have other objectives as to develop specific and enabling technologies and components. Also develop tools to support the design and operation maintenance of uh, offshore renewable energy farms. Develop state of the art in the field, obviously. Also, creating an elastic network between the early stage researchers, the network partners, and the associated partners. And lastly, uh, to facilitate the future job opportunities for our fellows. Um, yeah, um, how are we setting out to implement this project? Uh, first of all, by ensuring a market-oriented approach, we have um, an important connection with the key you know, energy um, Kikun Energy uh, projects, which are developing uh, pro projects, which are developing project uh, products in the offshore renewable energy sector. Uh, also, by implementing a training um, uh, program, which consists of nine short courses on several topics that cover a wide uh, 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 field, all through uh, wave energy and floating offshore wind energy. By offering secondment opportunities to our uh, associate partners to the industry. Uh, 
uh, to our fellows and, and so to create bonds and or strength, strengthen the bonds between academia and, and the industry. And also uh, by implementing 13 individual research projects, each carried out by one of the, the fellows we have in the initial training network. These individual uh, research projects are integrated in the three uh, scientific and technical work packages on environmental uh, monitoring uh, uh, hardware and tools, on the offshore farm energy deployment and operation maintenance, and also on technology development. Uh, of, out of our 13 early stage researchers, that 10 are currently enrolled in a PhD. Um, as you can see, uh, the, 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 the majority are French, uh, and this is the case of our two uh, fellows, which will be talking after this presentation. So we have also have some other uh, fellows uh, from other countries in Europe, but also beyond Europe. So thank you very much for your attention. This is. Well, thank you. So I'm Mathieu, and I'm here with my colleague Yannick and Boris. I'm going to. Uh, speak briefly about the uh, benefits of PhDs and master students at WAVEC. So my background, uh, in 2009 I've, I've graduated from Chalmers University of Technology in Gothenburg in Sweden. Uh, I have a master's degree in civil engineering and I did a master thesis which was mostly focused on uh, coastal defense structures. And from that on I had the opportunity to move on and to enroll within the WAVE Train 2 uh, project which is uh, what Jose was speaking just uh, well, previously. And I was a fellow at uh, Instituto Superior Tecnico from the Techn Technical University of Lisbon. And yeah, in that project during those three years, I developed some numerical tools for simulations of uh, uh, the dynamics of wave energy converters mostly. And also brought some, some projects to a couple of uh, European projects. And as a chance to enroll um, in a PhD program as a mechanical engineering department. Uh, after 2012, uh, I finished, so in June, the Wave Train 2 project, and I got a contract with the WaveEC Offshore Renewables. And I'm now uh, full time, like in the, uh, research engineering, the numerical modeling group. And so we bring still active supports on various uh, uh, European and international projects as well. Uh, some of them are, for example, the SD Web which uh, finished last year, some kick projects funding by the EIT, and in my case, one of the most important projects is the iWave project, uh, in partnership with Core Power, which is going to be presented by Patrick Müller. Okay, sorry. And uh, from the WaveX side, I'm doing the coordination of that project, but we also have some involvement in uh, a large panel of, of consulting services, such as, for example, a few of the clients we've been working with, Repsol, Lindley, and also uh, Global Renewable Solutions. And in parallel, uh, I'm doing, still working on my, on my PhD work. And I'm now giving the word to Eric. Well, uh, thank you, Mathieu, for uh, passing me the, the word. So, uh, my, uh, my name is Yannick De Bruyne. I'm a, I'm a French worker at Wavec, and I'm glad to be able to give you a short overview of my work. Uh, I, gra I graduated in 2013 from uh, Ecole Centrale de Nantes uh, with a degree uh, in general engineering and uh, specialization in hydrodynamics and ocean engineering. Uh, during this, uh, my studies, I had the, the opportunity to do two, two internships. So one was at Wavec in uh, 2012, where I worked on the or I study hydrodynamics of uh, wave energy converters. And then I concluded my study in 2013 with, a, with an internship at Marine Innovation and Technology that you might know as well now, I pr principal power. And I worked on the st some studies on the wind float platform and the mooring system of the wind float platform. <clears throat> so now um, I am presently a research engineer at Wavec uh, uh, in Lisbon. I am part of the numerical modeling group and uh, I had the opportunity to integrate WAVEC through the Ocean Net program that uh, Jose just presented. Uh, so this was a, a great opportunity for me to work 
on, uh, to focus on uh, the study of floating wind, uh, wind turbines and to uh, undertake a PhD on the dynamics and power production of floating wind turbines within a form. <coughs> I also participate in the, some collaborative projects that Wavec is involved in, such as the Demo Float project, which was a demonstration project for the Windfront platform, and the uh, development of the Kick uh, Boy that Wavec is also leading. Uh, and I, I participate in the development of numerical tools for Wavec. So, uh, brief talk now about my, the contribution that I can give as a, as a French worker uh, for Wavec. Well, uh, part of the objective of Wavec is to increase the network uh, in the re renew marine renewable energy field around the world. And so, in particular, we are trying to do it with France by providing internships to French students. So 2015 was a great year for that because we welcomed uh, three students, Benoit, Clara, and Mathieu, who the three of them, they, they did a, a great job. And Benoit uh, was uh, from uh, Ecole Centrale de Nantes, so it was a pleasure for me to, to welcome him. And, also, and as well, we are joining in some conferences, uh, such as the Tetis, Tetis conferences that uh, took place in Nantes in 2015. And, the conference being uh, part in, partially in French, it was uh, better to be a native French speaker to attend. And uh, well, that's part of the activities that uh, I'm involved in, and as well Boris, who I'm now giving the word to. So I'm the last member of the French crew in Wevec. Uh, I will also start by saying a bit about my background. Uh, I graduated in uh, engineering school in Rennes in, from a more multidisciplinary department. And the last, uh, to, to finish with this degree, I had to do a master project where I've been to Alborg in, uh, in Denmark. And this is where I discovered basically the world of uh, offshore renewable energy, uh, doing some numerical modeling, but also uh, support to tank testing for wave energy. And I really liked this, and uh, so I wanted to work on this field. And after this uh, graduation, I, did, uh, I spent almost three years in Ireland working in a research center near Dublin and uh, mostly focusing on techno-economic analysis and the development of a software for uh, a web energy developer. And after this, uh, my project finished in Ireland, so I looked for another job and I joined Wevec through the same project program as Yannick, so the Ocean project that has been presented by Jose. Uh, where I'm currently doing a PhD on the uh, analysis of innovative solution for wave energy. Uh, but uh, in parallel to this PhD, uh, what is, uh, I think, in my opinion, very nice in Wevec is we have the opportunity to work on a collaborative pro research project as well on the development of numerical tools. Uh, so in particular, I'm uh, especially involved in uh, those three projects. So the Polywork project that uh, briefly uh, Jose mentioned, which is developing a dielectric elastomer generator solution for PTO system of wave energy. Uh, the DT Ocean project, uh, which is uh, developing open source tool uh, for both tidal and wave energy. Uh, it's, in, it's a big project in collaboration with 18 partners, including uh, France Energy Marine in France, and the Wetfield project that Jose already <coughs> talked about. And most recently, in May, I also have been elected to the board of uh, an association called INOR, which means the International Network on uh, Offshore Renewable Energy. Uh, and I'm part of the committee that will uh, help the organization of uh, the symposium. So just to say a bit more about this association, uh, I think it fits very well the, the title of this panel because it's, it's really focused on uh, collaboration and cooperation. So it's an association of early stage researchers, which means uh, PhD, master, postdoc, uh, and uh, also junior engineers. And the goal, the main goal is really to uh, share knowledge and uh, promote collaboration between the members. We are currently over uh, 1,600 uh, members and from 78 countries. Uh, it's 10 years old association, or almost as old as, uh, as WEVEC, actually. Uh, one of our colleagues was uh, one of the creator of the association. Uh, and it, what we do are mostly those four things here. So the main event that we organize are symposium, 
or symposia. So they are typically now twice a year, one in Europe and one in the US. And it consists of a three to one week event uh, with uh, several uh, collaborative exercise, keynote speakers, uh, as well as some uh, visit to a specialized site or also uh, some uh, recreational activities. Uh, we've been uh, organizing 14 of them already. Uh, it's really the signature event of the association, I would say. Uh, but we also do more recently some workshops, which uh, typically consist of debate, where we invite some uh, experts uh, to discuss a specific topic uh, about offshore renewable energy. And this, uh, uh, this occurs next to uh, the major uh, conference on the sector. So lastly, for example, in France, uh, UTEC was uh, organized in September, and we did uh, one afternoon discussion on uh, whether uh, it's better to go for a big solution or a small solution for offshore renewable energy. Uh, another aspect of uh, things that we do is we offer uh, scholarships uh, through the help of the ocean energy system. Uh, and uh, this typically means uh, two members of the association meet uh, in one place to work on a specific uh, research topic and that leads uh, on some uh, papers publication. And uh, the last point here is OpenOR is a website uh, that we created that uh, is a, basically a platform where we share uh, open source code and any kind of material that uh, is uh, publicly available and also a forum for discussion on uh, specific topics related to offshore renewables. And I also put the website of the association, <coughs> sorry, for uh, further information. And lastly, uh, so as I mentioned, I'm part of the committee this year, and we are going to organize the major event of the association in France uh, in uh, near Nantes next year. So uh, we believe, and I think we've seen that throughout the first session, that uh, France, and in particular the region around Nantes, is extremely active. It's, uh, it's already uh, been proven last year through, or this year, sorry, through the Tetis and UTEC conferences. Uh, it's already a world-class uh, hub for marine renewable energy. Uh, ESON has been showing the, some of the amazing testing facility they have there. Uh, they also have the uh, port of Saint-Nazaire, uh, as well as many uh, R&D and industrial expertise uh, present in, in, the, in the region. So all this makes us believe that it can be a great place to organize such event. And uh, the, the idea of the event is that the members uh, are not charged. So uh, we work through sponsorships, uh, and I'm responsible for uh, coordinating this work. So there is plenty of opportunity for companies and uh, public institutions to uh, promote their branding through our association, which is, I, th I believe, very well recognized uh, internationally on the sector and we can provide uh, some uh, sponsorship package that can suit your needs. So if you are interested, uh, please get in touch with me. Uh, I can just say that uh, among the regular sponsors of the association, there is uh, WEVEC, uh, Ocean Energy System, and also INOSI. So yeah, please continue to help us and to support us. Thank you very much. Bonjour, bon dia. Uh, we will, I will try to introduce to you our unique technology that we've been developing together with our Portuguese and uh, French partners over the last years. Let's see if we get a presentation up here. Um, I have some problem there. Uh, I can start speaking briefly. In, in the meanwhile, we are a Swedish developer, as uh, mentioned. But from the very beginning, uh, we were looking at uh, what had been done in terms of understanding the fundamentals of wave energy around Europe. And when we started actually testing out this technology, we early came into contact with the Wave Energy Center here in uh, Portugal. And since 2012, we've been developing this technology here and in Nantes. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that the, the, one of the key challenges with wave power, as we see it, is designing a device which is robust enough to survive the toughest storms, but then at the same time generate enough energy to pay back the investment and make it a viable business case. And one of the major problems so far is simply that wave energy converters have been too large, too heavy, and thereby too costly compared to their energy output, which has prevented uh, commercial harvesting. 
And this is something we are working very hard to improve. If you look at the current state of the art, this is uh, the famous study done by Babari and Hals, where you look at how much energy can be generated over a year per ton of device, basically a measure on how much material do you need to generate a certain amount of energy. You can say that the state of the art in wave power today, it's somewhere just above one megawatt hour per ton. If you look at a modern wind turbine, you are more close to 10 megawatt hour per ton. And we believe strongly that we need to improve this if we're gonna make wave power competitive. And that's what we set out to do. Uh, Core Power has developed a compact, high efficiency wave energy converter. Uh, it's inspired by the pumping principles of the human heart. We use phase control technology to make these buoys oscillate in resonance with uh, incoming waves. And by help of resonance, we can strongly amplify the motion and thereby the power capture of, of these devices. This amplified motion is then converted into grid quality electricity using a new type of clean mechanical drivetrain, which is located inside of uh, devices. Our full-scale technology is aimed to be around 8 meter in diameter, and a device of around 60 to 70 tons will be able to generate around 300 kilowatt in a typical Atlantic coast uh, climate with that. It's a pre-tensioned technology, so we used a taut leg uh, mooring, a single leg, where we co-route the electrical cables and the communication down to the seabed uh, through that as well. Some of the most important features here is that we can build small compact devices, which is good for capex, but they are also very important to allow transportation and installation and service to be done using low-cost vessels, which is a concept that we are currently proving out. Uh, we started verifying the performance of this technology. In 2012, we worked in numerical modeling and really understanding the details of the control together with Wavec and together with the NTNU of Trondheim in Norway. And we did our first round of tank testing in scale 1 to 30. Uh, we had a small team in Core Power at that time, three to four people. So we partnered with some of the best people here in Portugal and Norway and we were able to prove in a very cost-effective and, and good way that uh, by testing at FOIP in Porto, we could show how we could increase the amount of energy per ton more than five times. So we proved around eight megawatt hours per ton in our testing in, in Porto in 2013. Uh, at that time, we also established a very structured product uh, verification plan where we decided to really prove the uh, performance and have a clear view on the economics in each step and prove the technology in small scale before uh, putting on a large team and spending uh, large efforts on large machinery. So in our stage two program, which has been taking place over 2014 and 15, we have built out a scale one to three PTO test bed uh, in Stockholm and we have tested the technology in uh, Nantes in scale 1 to 16. The test rig uh, that we're running in Stockholm in scale 1 to 3 looks like this. And here we've been able to prove out all the control functionality to emulate all the different failure modes. And our goal here is to find every failure, every error that we could find on land before we actually put the device into the water. And in parallel with this, we have had also some new inventions being added to the technology uh, from NTNU. A new type of face control technology that we call face spring uh, was invented. And it's a negative spring arrangement that makes our devices inherently resonant. It means that we no longer need to measure anything about the incoming waves. We don't need any active control to make them resonant. They are giving a broadbanded response to incoming waves without information about them, which is quite unique. And uh, we have later developed our technology uh, around this principle. If we look inside our composite buoy, uh, the first unique piece of technology where we have IP is a pretensioning technology that allows us to build a lightweight device. And the function of this is that we have a natural frequency much higher than any of the incoming waves meaning we are a poor absorber of energy uh, in its natural state. That's how we want to be. That means that when the big storms come in and we turn off our phase control, 
we are very transparent to incoming energy, meaning we have good survivability. After we have uh, arranged the high natural frequency, we control the stiffness of the device by the wave spring technology, where we have some important patents. And by this, the device becomes resonant to the waves. You see how the buoy moves, it jumps out of the top of the wave and dives down into the trough of it. And it actually does that no matter which direction the wave is coming uh, or the, what frequency it is. And that's the magic uh, of the wave spring technology that we have developed here. And this proved out for the first time hydrodynamically uh, at Col Central Nantes uh, during uh, last year. And in parallel, we've proven out this new cascade gearbox technology that has been developed in parallel, where we transfer the large linear loads into rotation uh, inside device. But to really make the decision on whether this wave spring technology was better compared to the latching that we have been using in the past, we needed some very detailed understanding of the hydrodynamics and the performance and the loads of it. So we set out to do a large test program uh, funded through Marinette, also with support from Kikino Energy and the uh, Swedish Energy Agency. We work together with Wavec and with researchers from uh, Ecole Centrale Nantes. And we were able to prove out this wave spring technology in, in record time, I would say, because we had been working very uh, focused on latching, which is a more known technology for years. And in a short amount of time, we were able to prove a new technology and then switch over our whole device development uh, based on that. And the testing we did in Nantes uh, proved to us uh, the function of this with different buoy shapes and the hydrodynamics around that. And most importantly, we could prove that in terms of structural efficiency, with WaveSpring, we were able to improve the amount of energy that can be delivered per um, kilonewton of PTO force by three times compared to what we have seen being possible uh, in the past with uh, previous state-of-the-art devices. And when it comes to the amount of annual energy per ton, we were able to prove more than 10 megawatt hours per ton with the performance that we got with WaveSpring. So the conclusions we could make with that is that the amount of annual energy that you could improve with a certain amount of buoy is similar between, for instance, latching and, and, and wave spring. But the big advantage is that you don't increase the forces on the equipment when you use this continuous wave spring control compared to latching. And that was the big point for us to, to pick that one. And we believe we're now bringing a technology to market that can actually allow the wave sector to match the structural efficiency of uh, modern wind turbines. And this is what we're now trying to prove also in the next phase. Through the non-testing, we were also able to prove the survivability of the device in the most uh, extreme conditions. We're now watching a 32 meter wave coming in. Uh, we could correlate and calibrate all the loading of the equipment to show that we have survivability in, in the toughest conditions. Uh, right now, we are working to prove this in a stage three program uh, where we are just funded uh, and we secured six and a half million euros for this recently. And we're now getting backing in a broad consortium over Europe in involving both uh, Portugal, Sweden, Norway, and Scotland. And our latest backing came from uh, the Wave Energy Scotland initiative. Uh, where we are today, the stage three program being funded there. And we aim to prove this step change uh, improvement, we should say, to the efficiency of wave power through a land-based setup where we in Stockholm are going to prove the equipment over half a year during the uh, latter part of 2016 and then put the whole device to test at EMEC uh, during the first half of 17. And uh, we're going to do the testing at Scapa Flow, which is a more protected part uh, of EMEC. And we believe very strongly that we should prove this out in a step-wise uh, approach. And that's why we're taking the step of a going of a half-scale ocean demonstration. Assuming we get the data that we expect in this phase, we are already working hard to uh, set up further collaborations to do a full-scale demonstration. Uh, we're working with partners here in Portugal. To, to make that happen. And we're also having a lot of French in, involvement in our team. We have 
today grown close to 20 people. And we have uh, in our team today, uh, Pierre, uh, Cédric, uh, Francois, and uh, Jean-Michel, and uh, Jeremine. So we have a big French touch to, to Core Power uh, also, just by the team. And we hope by 17 to be able to, to start uh, full-scale piloting. And hopefully in, in France or Portugal, uh, it's some of the target markets we're going for. Sweden doesn't have a wave resource. We have way too much uh, hydro. So we're entirely focusing on Portugal, France, Spain, and the UK. Uh, our business model is focused in developing and selling the device itself, where we're working with larger, more established infrastructure players to actually put it together to a farm to take care of the installations, the moorings, and the grid connection. In our current high wave pilot, uh, we're working with Ibedrola Engineering and Construction in this role. And when we're targeting key customers around these geographies, we are open for new collaborations also on project development and infrastructure and in manufacturing. And we're hoping really to, to give wave power that push that has been needed for a long time to really show a path to, to make it commercial. And speaking about Portugal uh, and France, we think that the large components of these devices should be manufactured locally. We're having a lot of development at the moment to uh, develop our supply chain. One example is composite manufacturing capacity that we're currently exploring if we could do here in Portugal. Also mooring systems and control technologies areas that we're working uh, intensely with. Uh, um, first of all, I'd like to thank Wavec for the opportunity to speak here today and also ask for the last 10 minutes of your attention before lunch. I know this is a terrible time slot to speak to you and it's probably the longest you've gone all day without caffeine, but I'll try and make this as snappy and interesting as I possibly can. Um, ProDrone is the first spin-off uh, of Wavec and uh, you've heard a lot about the research background and how... Uh, the focuses of, of Wavec currently, but I'd like to make a bit of a case about how I think it could actually be a hub for uh, great innovation and how it is and could be fostered uh, furthermore. And we are an example of just that. So um, I've been with, I was with Wavec for a very long time. I was there for seven years. And one of the things that I quickly became aware of is that you're constantly thrown opportunities to grow. I mean, um, within Wavec, you are exposed to the whole uh, market and the whole workflow from research institutions to utilities to small operators to everything. So you're constantly aware of um, all these different players and what their priorities are. And this global network, and it is truly global, is an amazing resource for anyone who is interested in creating innovation and value. And lastly, but importantly, at Wavec, we are always given the freedom to explore these opportunities. Um, so within uh, our obvious uh, constraints and our duties, um, there is space for us to look at it, so to, to look at opportunities and pursue them. And so I think this is very important. And these are just some images of different, uh, over seven years of the different aspects that I was involved in, whether that be with operating ROVs, doing hardware development and on offshore monitoring boy, uh, being present at fairs, or doing different educational programs. So a bit about uh, how ProDrone started. Um, well, I was very involved with a lot of the monitoring work we did at the, at the, at the wind float. Uh, so I was trying to book these boats and trying to see what the right weather windows were and we had all these different uh, constraints. So I was living the day-to-day -day issues of all the logistics of operating offshore. And this merged with something unrelated to work, which was a friend of mine who does uh, movies of, um, of surf. And he was really trying to think about how he could get different kind of shots. And I wondered why he possibly couldn't use drones to film uh, surf, and this was before there were all these YouTube videos. And somehow, at some point, these two ideas merged. Um, and I thought, why don't we use drones to inspect wind turbines? And it came at a very good timing at Wavec, because uh, Wavec was starting to explore with product development. And Kikino Energy had a big role here. So Kikino Energy is making a big push 
towards uh, fostering innovation in Europe across the board. And um, Wavec was one of the first to get involved with the Kiko TS offshore monitoring boy project. And I, I was lucky enough to be uh, heavily involved in that. So that really opened up in me uh, the opportunity of realizing what value is. And this was incredible. So, so besides all this research that we did at Wavec, there was actually the ability to uh, create something that could have commercial value and actually have a very big impact. And it was great to be able to pursue that. And then I took a bunch of entrepreneurship courses. So currently I am, uh, I've got a degree in marine biology and oceanography and I'm CEO of a, I guess what you could call a robotics company. So uh, that was a bit of a shift. And through Wavec I did a bunch of different courses both in Portugal and abroad at Ezad in Barcelona that enabled me to gain the skills to pursue this project. Validation. Uh, one of the most important things uh, that Wavec was able to provide to allow program to exist was that after our idea, and I brainstormed with Professor Sarmiento and Miguel, uh, we thought, okay, the next step is obviously validation. And within two weeks, I, could, I was able to bring together around a table a UAV manufacturer, an inspection specialist, a sensor integration specialist, uh, and we all just brainstormed to see if this idea made any sense at all. And it's actually a really privileged thing to be able to do to have access to the whole network of the value chain and actually ask them if our ideas make sense. And they did. And lastly, the execution. I mean, um, Wavec was involved all the way through. I mean, I was at Wavec when I did all the proposals and I had a help from many people. And that has transitioned into the company itself. I mean, I have uh, all the support I need. So um, I, I really think that this setup could be replicated to a whole bunch of different ideas that could be generated at Wavex, such as the ones that uh, Anna showed. So now a bit more onto ProDrone and what we do and why we do it. The problem what we're addressing is that of blade inspections. Um, blade inspections are an integral part of the O&M costs of wind turbines. They can account for up to 30% of a turbine's efficiency. It's a great timing because there's a shift now going from um, corrective maintenance towards preventative maintenance. And there's a huge cost on reduction of O&M, particularly offshore. I mean, we've heard all these stories and we can all relate to how expensive and hard it is to operate offshore. And in Europe in particular, we now start having a problem of aging infrastructure. We started uh, doing a big push for installation, you know, 10, 15 years ago, and now a lot of this infrastructure is getting older and needs more and more maintenance. And so, how are blades inspected today? Um, traditionally, they're inspected through rope work. This involves an inspector or two roping down each single blade, you know, rappelling down each one of these blades. Um, these are incredibly detailed inspections, but they're expensive. Um, they require a lot of downtime, time the turbine has to be stopped, and they're a pretty ob obvious health and safety hazard. Alternatively, we have ground camera inspections, which are really cheap, easy to deploy, but because of the distance to the blade, they're really limited in the quality and type of data they can acquire. And more recently, UAVs have, have shown up, uh, promising to bring a lot of the advantages of both. But for some reason, they're not the standard. Uh, they haven't been able to deliver on the efficacy or the safety side of it. And why is this? Well, first of all, they either rely on manual piloting, which is extremely hard and delicate operation, completely pilot uh, skill dependent, or they could try and do a GPS-based inspection. But the GPS itself already has an accuracy of around three to four meters, which is more than enough to miss the blade. When you're close to a uh, structure, you can lose up to 50% of the signal just because you lose line of sight. And you also have signal refraction of it. So GPS is not a good solution to, to, to do inspections. And importantly, all these result in monitoring discontinuities. So each day on a different day with a different pilot, you'll have a different outcome out of your inspection. So the client simply doesn't know what he can rely on. So he prefers to use the methods, which even if more expensive, they know what, what the output is. So currently, UAV inspections are not the robust solution the industry is demanding. What is it demanding? Automation. And that is what we are developing at ProDrone. 
Instead of navigating in relation to the fingers of a pilot or to a constellation of satellites hundreds of kilometers away, we've integrated space awareness sensors into our drones, allowing them to navigate directly in relation to the most important structure of all, the blade itself. Here is a video of our current prototype. As soon as you see the green light blink, it's gone into full autonomous mode. It calculates real time the optimum monitoring position and goes and sits on it and maintains it. Then the only thing the pilot has to do is guide it along the blade and collect the data. Furthermore, we, because we're always managing the distance to it, we can impose a minimum safety distance that will override any attempt to get closer to the blade than that. And that virtually eliminates all collisions, making it a much safer operation. And this is half the solution. The other half is what we do with the large amounts of data that we collect. We've divided this into four steps of image enhancement and normalization, automatic fault finding, running algorithms on the images of the, of the blade to help uh, find the issues, placing all this data on the cloud so that it can be easily accessed from anywhere in the world, and then finally integrating it with the software that actually manages the wind park itself. So it's by combining the automating of the flight and the robustness that that gives you on the data set, as well as how you treat this data, that we're delivering a wholly innovative and robust solution to wind blade inspections. But how big a market is this? Well, it's large. There are over 280,000 turbines in the world. That's almost a million blades spinning constantly. And importantly, it's growing. And it's growing onshore. But importantly, it's growing a lot offshore. And this is where we have the most market pull, because O&M expenditure is expected to double by 2020. And we think we can bring a lot of value to the offshore market. The UAV market for the inspection of wind turbines alone is expected to grow to over $6 billion in the next nine years, and is generally accepted as going to become the standard of blade inspections. They're just waiting for someone to crack this. Lastly, it's an easily transferable technology. That means that by easily adapting the algorithms that do the flight and the post-processing, we can easily adapt this to inspect any vertical structure. Bridges, communication towers, uh, you name it. Some of our achievements to date. We have, uh, two months ago, we filed our first patent and are currently patent pending for Europe. We carried out our first successful paid uh, pilot in August of 2015, uh, where we were able to prove uh, not only our platform, but the kind of resolutions that we can get on the blade, because we can operate so safely, we're looking at around 0 0.1 millimeter resolution on the blade, and that's enough for you to find a bunch of different cracks. We have a working autonomous prototype, which I've showed you, and then we're you the market leader with 22 offices worldwide, and letters of intent from four major players. Uh, and I know at least two of them are here today. And just sort of fresh off the press, uh, two weeks ago, uh, we won the Kikino Energy um, pitching contest in Berlin. Uh, so we, were, we won over 106 different companies. Patrick, I, I believe you won that a couple of years ago, right? All right. It's an honor to... <laughs> okay. so, so, so that was a great news for us. Our biggest achievement to date, however, has been the number of the people that we've been able to put together to take this project forward. Uh, we have a highly complementary, motivated team tackling this problem every single day. And importantly, we have a great support structure from Kik, from uh, IST, from Wavec, and from an inspection um, specialist, which give us uh, access to all this knowledge and know-how uh, that are really helpful to take this forward. This year, we achieved the proof of concept, and next year, if everything goes well, we'll be doing a bunch of different uh, autonomous inspections onshore and then offshore in the summer. By 2017, we expect to be fully operational, and by the end of the year, ready to license the technology. We believe the only way to actually make this business scalable is to allow independent operators across the world to operate our technology. And by 2018, we believe that it is 
perfectly achievable to have a fully autonomous blade inspection. This means that you take a UAV out of, out of the van, you put it on the floor, you press the button, the UAV flies, collects the data, lands, and all you have to do is upload it. My current job today is to look for funding. Uh, just this Thursday, we handed in uh, our Portugal Ventures. Uh, we're also in discussions with the three more investors currently. Um, if anyone knows of anyone interested, or if you are yourself, please feel free to come forward. Um, yeah, so this is our story, and um, uh, I hope that it shows that for us, uh, the sky is not the limit. It's our office. Thank you very much. Thank you.